I am a campus recruiter at Mercer. Thank you all for taking the time to attend our Government Human Services Consulting 101 session today. I will be the moderator for the call. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we would love to see your beautiful faces, so feel free to keep your videos on if you choose. Everyone's mics are currently muted, um, and we ask that you keep yourself on mute for the duration of the presentation portion. However, there will be time for Q&A at the end where you can unmute yourself to ask a question. Additionally, as we move through the presentation today, feel free to ask any You just muted yourself. I think someone just muted me. Um, and <laughs> we will uh, do our best to get your questions answered. Um, and Lastly, following the presentation, uh, we will reach out to all of you uh, with additional Mercer resources, along with information on our future sessions, plus the link to the session recording. And um, additionally, once our positions are officially opened, we will share the opportunities with you, along with instructions on how to apply. So now let's get the session started. We have a great speaker with us today, Stacy Betts, who is excited to chat with you all. Uh, Stacy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ozma. Um, I'm excited, as Ozma mentioned, I'm super excited to be here with y'all today. Um, in this virtual environment, I know this is new for all of us, so I really appreciate you hanging in there with us. Um, I'm sure you're getting a lot of lectures with your classes already, so I promise I'll keep my comments short. Um, and give you all a lot of time for asking any questions that you'd like of me. Um, so about me, I am a consultant in the Mercer government practice. I am based in Phoenix, Arizona. So yes, it's very, very hot here today. Um, and uh, I've been with Mercer next month in November. It will be 21 years. Um, I started in the government practice 21 years ago and then moved to the health practice, which government is part of, and we'll talk about that. And then came back to my first love of government uh, about nine years ago. Um, my role is currently as the national hiring lead for uh, Mercer government for all of our analyst positions, which includes college. So for all of you guys that are in school now, which is probably most of you, um, I'll be your primary contact within the business for Mercer Government. So let's get in. As I was thinking about what to talk to you guys about, I really was trying to think about what makes Mercer Government special. And I think the first place to start is, let me get to my next slide here, is really, you know, that we're part of Marsha McLennan. So uh, Mercer Government is a small division within Mercer, and Mercer is one of the companies within Marsha McLennan. Um, I think that's important because it's a big firm that's been around a really long time with a really solid history. So you're backed with that um, just incredible community that is part of the MMC um, world. It is a Fortune 250 company um, and has clients in more than 130 countries, which I just think is kind of cool. So I wanted to share that if you didn't already know. Um, but now let's move on to Mercer. So we're kind of dialing it down just a little bit. We started the Marsha McLennan. Um, now, we are part of Mercer, and um, Mercer has over 25,000 employees globally with over 29,000 clients, um, and if you've attended some of our other sessions that have been really helpful, you've learned about our health and our wealth and our career opportunities as well. So again, just kind of a flavor, I won't go into all of those um, numbers, but it just kind of gives you a sense for just how diverse and how big Mercer is. So moving down to from the big world of Mercer and Marsha McLennan, let's talk about Mercer government. So where I work, um, so GHSC, so that stands for Government Human Services Consulting. Um, that's still a pretty big mouthful, even with the GHSC acronym. So you'll hear us talk about Mercer government, um, which is kind of our new tagline that we're trying to use because it just seems a little easier for all of us to really kind of understand. Um, so. Mercer Government, GHSC, we assist public entities in becoming more effective purchasers of healthcare through a variety of ways. We have sectors that we'll talk about in actuarial, financial, behavioral health, clinical quality, pharmacy, policy, and a whole host of other things. So 
you know, what does that mean, right? So all that really means is that we work with those public entities, which generally speaking are state governments, um, and we primarily focus in the Medicaid space. So you may be familiar with Medicaid or maybe not. Um, I certainly wasn't before coming to Refer Mercer, so if you are, you're ahead of the game there. Um, so Medicaid is the public health care that states offer to either the disabled or to the poor in any population. So generally those under the poverty level. Um, states are responsible for paying for that health care and providing that health care to those individuals. So as you might imagine, it's a pretty big undertaking and a pretty um, big expense for any given state. Um, so uh, it's a complicated world. And so state governments hire people like Mercer. Uh, Mercer government, we are the preeminent leader in this space. Um, and so we have currently 35 of the 50 states as clients. And you'll see a map of our services here uh, coming up in the presentation. Um, so it's a pretty complicated business. And so they hire consultants like us and we work in a group team setting to really kind of problem solve and think about these big picture items and how we can help those states give better quality health care to those people in that vulnerable population. So we do that out of four offices. So of course, Mercer is a global firm um, and Mercer Health as well. Um, we are part of Mercer Health and our division is located in these four offices here. As I mentioned, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. We also have an office in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Atlanta, uh, Georgia, and then also a small office in DC. Those are primarily our policy folks that are working with the federal government on policy decisions that, that flow down to our state clients. So moving on from that, um, so there's a whole lot of information here in this slide, and honestly, I'm not sure if it if it um, it's overwhelming or if it's interesting data. I think it's kind of cool, but Maybe I'm just um, a little nerdy like that. Um, but the key points here is what we're trying to show is, so we started in 1985. Again, Mercer's been around longer than that, but Mercer government started in 1985. We started with one client and one little project. Um, why I'm in Phoenix, our first client was the state of Arizona, and we did actuarial rate setting for them. And so that was our first, that was the start of a really profitable and cool business for Mercer that has grown in the last five years, we've doubled year over year, um, and we are projecting to continue to do that over the next five to 10 years. So uh, rapidly growing, um, and so from that one client and one kind of line of business, that actuarial work, uh, we now will see have grown to those 35 clients um, in states, as well as across a variety of sectors and specialties. So if you're not an actuary on the call, don't worry. Um, that's not the only thing we do. Um, we actually hire more non-actuaries than we hire actuaries, but certainly we're looking for actuaries as well. Um, so we have over 350 staff in those four offices we talked about. Um, we do have experience in 44 states and the federal government. As I said, we have about 35 right now. Um, and another cool thing I'll talk about here, just on the side, the 11 year tenure. So we really build strong relationships. So consulting, if you've not talked with any consultants um, in your career journey, um, consulting is really about relationships and really about the people and um, problem solving. So it's those two things kind of combined. Um, so if you like relationship building and you like problem solving, consulting might really be a great option for you. Um, so 11 years, so we really, that's rare in the public health care space. So, you know, when you're working with the government, having an 11 year relationship average, that's really big. Um, it may not seem huge, but that's, that's, uh, you know, unimaginable across any other company, any one of our competitors. So that's a really cool thing we're proud of. And over the time, I think that that's going to continue to grow as we get, um, further down the road. So I'm going to move to, um, you'll notice. Um, the bottom blue thing, we say our commitment to helping our clients manage their publicly funded programs and employing, oops, and employing top talent. So again, I talked about that people aspect. So we're not out there making widgets. We're not, you know, on an assembly line somewhere where we're creating, you know, some, some part that's going to go into something. Our product is really our people. So people is the central thing for our firm. Um, everybody asks me, um, I'm guessing that might be in the chat, you know, why have you stayed there 21 years? Um, that's a really long time. 
Um, honestly, it wasn't my plan, but Mercer is just so phenomenal and has just given me so many opportunities. Um, and I really love the investment into our people. So um, employing the top talent and focus on teamwork is really a core part of who and what we are um, and what I really love about Mercer. Um, okay, so now we can move on to this next slide. So hopefully this will give you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of work we do. I've got a few more slides that we'll kind of unpack it a little bit. Um, it's complex. Um, you're not going to end up being a Medicaid expert at the end of this call, not my intention. Um, happy to have any sidebar conversations um, offline um, about some of that, um, should you be interested. So our very largest department, we call them sectors, is our actuarial and our financial. It's down on the top right. Um, essentially, that's the analysis of the numbers. Um, so we identify opportunities where we can get program savings. I talked about the really big cost and the big lift for state governments to um, provide good quality health care um, to this population. Um, it's a big job and um, there's never enough budget, right? Um, I'm sure we all feel that a little bit on our own personal checkbook sometimes. So skates are no different. Um, so we really want to make sure we're getting the best quality health care and the best access to health care to those individuals. So really the actual and the financial departments work together to really you know, analyze that and try to find program savings and ways to provide that better access to care. Our second biggest uh, sector, again, department, is informatics and the data department. So we hire a lot of college students in the actual and financial and the informatics department. These are our business analysts. So in order to predict the future, um, consultants, you know, often we're kind of like the person with our crystal ball, we're trying to imagine what's going to happen in the future because we need to help our clients plan for that. Um, in order for us to make those educated predictions, um, you know, we really need to look at the past. Data really does tell a story and it's really how we can start to predict what's going to happen in the future based on uh, current and past data. Um, so our folks uh, really analyze humongous data sets. Um, you know, the, the term big data definitely applies to Medicaid claims data. You can just imagine just the volumes of data that comes in. Um, and they're going to really data validate and mine and really analyze and work with our other teams. They're also listed here in all these other sectors to make sure that those teams have the data that they need to make those decisions. Um, we do have our policy group that we talked about. Uh, most of those are in DC. They're former federal government employees, most of them. And they really help advise us and make sure that we understand all the regulations that are coming down from the federal government that are going to affect our state government clients so that we can advise them of ways to mitigate um, if there's new regulation, new policies, new procedures, how do we incorporate those into their regular day-to-day -day work. And then we have our clinical operations and our pharmacy departments that do some things as well. Um, all right, I'm going to get into just a little bit more. I talked about actuarial and financial solutions. This is our largest sector where we do hire the majority of our students. Um, so I wanted to just unpack that just a tiny little bit. Um, I mentioned rate setting. So, you know, if you go to the doctor now, let's say you're going to go just for a checkup, that doctor is going to be paid a certain dollar amount from your insurance company. Um, for that, and you may or may not have a copay on top of that. So really, those numbers are made by actuaries that are setting rates. Um, Medicaid is no different, and so we spend a lot of our time rate setting is kind of our bread and butter, um, and because it's, it's mandatory for every single state, and so we do have to do that. Um, but then we also do a ton of financial analysis. We'll do efficiency studies. How can we be better as a state? How can they be better to make sure that they're able to squeeze out a few more dollars and make sure that they can provide a little bit better health care, um, maybe add a product line or something like that, um, just by making some efficiency adjustments. Um, risk consulting, cost evaluation, waiver analysis is really huge. Um, again, that's just trying to figure out the various policies and procedures that are coming down from the federal government, and then various technical assistance support things. So um, consulting, um, you never really know what you're going to get. Um, you know, we, we come in with a plan, but it's something new every day. And often, um, you know, I always say that if these problems were easy, the states wouldn't have to hire a consultant, right? So these are complex issues, but that we can all work together in a team environment to really, you know, evaluate and brainstorm and try to come up with really innovative ways that we can help our clients just do better. 
Um, and so it's an exciting world to live in. Um, it's fast paced for sure. Um, here's just a little bit more information on that informatics department, which is our second largest sector. If you're a business analytics uh, major or somebody that's really into big data or data science, um, this is your jam. Uh, and so uh, our team uses SAS, um, which seems to be a little bit more heavier in the healthcare space. Um, so if you have SQL or any of those other kind of business data analytics tools, um, that all translates really well over to SAS. Um, so we do a ton of different kinds of data analytics, readiness reviews, um, analyzing information. Um, as I mentioned, really the past data and the current data really does inform the future decisions that we make for our clients. Um, so this isn't part of my normal spiel, um, but this data set was, this slide was just so interesting to me. And again, maybe I'm just super nerdy and um, I'll totally admit it. Um, I just thought that this was fascinating. And so for any of you data folks or math nerds, I might be on the call. Um, hopefully you'll find it kind of fun too. It just talks about just the sheer volume that, of stuff that we're getting to analyze data that we're analyzing for our clients. Um, 8 billion active records for our current clients. Um, Informatics is doing data analytics now for 28 states. Um, I mentioned they're our second largest sector, so they're a little over 60 uh, right now. My guess is by the end of next year, they'll probably be 70, 75. Uh, perhaps even higher. Um, so that's big volume, big data. So, it, you know, it, it truly is big data. And these folks are amazing at reviewing and still, still fully understanding, frankly, our clients' data better than the client themselves knows it, um, which is a really nice place to be and what we really want to do um, and make sure that we're serving our clients well. Um, so I mentioned our map of services. Um, Honestly, there's no quiz here. You don't need to um, understand what all of this means necessarily, but I think it's kind of cool to, at least for me, when I think of why do I wanna work for Mercer Government or why do I wanna work for Mercer? Um, I really think um, in the span of 30 years, um, where it, you look where Arizona is, where I'm sitting today, um, there would have only been one little pie slice back then and 30 years ago. Now, over the course of that time, we have expanded to all of these different states. And then also, um, more, and maybe even more importantly, within those states, not just doing one tiny little thing where a state would have maybe eight different companies working on different kinds of projects, we've expanded our scope of services so that we truly are a holistic approach to a client. So we, we, we don't just have one area of expertise within all of Medicaid and all of their public health care needs. We can really bring on, we've got licensed pharmacists, licensed medical doctors. Um, we of course have our informatics team, we already talked about um, clinicians. We have you know, social workers, we have um, clinical psychologists, a lot of behavioral health given that that's a really big uh, key item right now in the healthcare in general, not just in public health care. So we can really take a very holistic approach and work together across specialties to really make sure that we're doing what's right for the clients and ultimately for all of that population that really is being served by that particular client. Um, so anyway, it's just a, I think it's an interesting ev um, involvement of what Mercer government has done. Um, I think I was number 74 or 75 employee um, back 21 years ago, and of course now we're at um, over 350, I think we're almost close to 400 now. Um, so that's a really cool growth and something I'm really proud to have been a part of and continue to be a part of. Um, all right, so, you know, hopefully, you know, I know it's a really complicated world that we work in and, and most of you probably have no information on Medicaid. Again, I didn't. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little flavor for kind of the work we do, and I'm happy to answer some questions when we get there on further. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, culture in an, in an office is also important. And so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about our office culture a little bit. Uh, we work hard. We work really hard sometimes. Um, these are big problems, as I've mentioned. But we make a lot of time for fun. Um, I think if you talk to any recruiter that has worked with us, um, they definitely know that government um, is very competitive with each other. We have a lot of games. Um, uh, Ozma, who introduced me here, um, has participated in a lot of various competitions and games with, with me and my group over the years. And um, 
we thrive in it because that's really how that team aspect and that interaction and that engagement is critical for us, you know, enjoying ourselves at work. Um, so uh, there is a ton of fun things. We do costume contests at um, Halloween, chili cook-offs, um, there's potlucks, um, there's always, always, always food and consulting environment for sure. Um, November, we spend a lot of time focusing on community service, um, which is something that I'm personally very passionate about. I actually led our uh, community service uh, resource group, Mercer Cares, which I'll talk about in the next slide, um, for the last five years. Um, and I passed the names over this past year um, to somebody else so that they could have an opportunity to use that. That we've spent a lot of time, we'll do work at food banks and the Dunk for Charity. Um, you know, we, we did uh, all of our business leaders. So that's our president and CEO, uh, Sam Practice Leader, Sam Espinosa, in the dunk tank there. Can't see his face very well. Um, but I approached all the leaders, all the partners, and they all got in the dunk tank and we were able to dunk them for charity. People were able to buy tickets and uh, they brought their families and their kids. Um, and we had snow cones and all sorts of other fun things to raise money. So that was a really fun event and a fun day. And I love that our leadership are willing to kind of put themselves out there, um, A, for the fun of the firm and the fun of the, the staff, but more importantly, to do some good in our community. Um, November, you can see uh, each team kind of got involved and um, kind of participated in uh, the Movember, the girls that couldn't, that didn't grow beards got uh, fake mustaches there to participate as well. Um, all right, so I talked about the business resource groups a little bit just a second ago. Um, so we have several, and these business resource groups are amazing. They're um, colleague-led, but sponsored by the firm, and each, each one of these has an executive sponsor, both at the global leadership as well as the office leadership perspective. Mercer Cares focuses on the community, volunteering, racial and ethnic diversity business resource group. Um, we we'll have a few more sessions in our national that you'll actually hear from some of these leaders as well. Um, women at Mercer, um, how can women be more successful in, and grow to more leadership positions? Um, fun fact, the Mercer government practice actually has more women leaders than men. Um, I don't know how that happened, but um, we, we promote equally. And uh, we've got a lot of girl power in the Mercer government practice. So, um, and then we have our pride business resource group. Um, so these are thriving in all of our offices. Um, these are not specific to Mercer government. These are specific to Mercer, but Mercer government is extremely passionate about supporting our business resource groups um, and is a vital part of our engagement throughout our office. So um, a couple examples are uh, pride resource group last year um, sponsored a speaker to come in, a national speaker to come in and really talk about unconscious bias. Um, we've re resurrected that again this year in light of, you know, current events, and we've gone through that training again. But last year, um, it was great for them to be on the forefront and providing that training. Um, lots of other kinds of training, how to women, and women to balance work and life. I think a women at Mercer have done some remote um, some remote type styles, how do you balance homeschooling the kids, um, you know, with online school while you're still trying to work and do other things. So providing that balance and giving some tips and tricks. So that has been really helpful. Um, okay, so I promised I would keep it brief. I don't know if I really did. I think I did, maybe under 30 minutes. So hopefully you've been asking or thinking about what questions you might like to ask. Um, feel free to ask whatever you like. Um, I'll do my very best to answer. Um, or um, I've got Michaela and Ozma that are also monitoring the chat. So I'm going to turn it over to Ozma and she can instruct you on the next steps in your um, Q&A session. Hello everyone. Thank you, Stacy, for that lovely presentation. Um, it looks like we have a few questions in that Stacy, you could probably address. Um, one of them is, uh, does a single consultant work in each of these areas or is it specialized? One consultant in policy and another one in pharmacy, for example. That is a fantastic question. So uh, kudos to whoever asked that. That's a really insightful question. Um, so when you're hired into Mercer, you are hired into a specific specialty area, um, meaning you're hired into a sector or so let's just 
drill it down to at the college level. Um, so at the college level, you would come in as a financial analyst or as an actuarial analyst. Both of those would be in the same department. Um, or you would come in as a pharmacy analyst or an informatics data analyst. It would be based on your interests. Um, so for example, typically a financial analyst really enjoys that, um, that financial analysis. Maybe it's an Excel or BBA or whatever it might be, and they enjoy that analysis but that's going to be a very different skill set and a different interest level than say somebody that's interested in data science and that would want to be in our informatics department using SAS and really evaluating the data doing the data manipulation. So um, we sometimes do over the course of your career have people that switch specialties or maybe even cross maybe 50 50 um, it's rare, but we've certainly had several um, folks that have done it um, generally speaking, though, your area of interest kind of drives where you are. Um, you didn't ask this, but I'll also kind of give you a, a bonus answer here. Um, you are then not working on all 35 states. Um, that would be insane. Um, and so um, you're typically assigned one or two states, but then within that one or two states, you could be working on you know five to 10 different kinds of projects at any given time so that you're never really doing the same thing in board. Um, and then, of course, the kinds of projects evolve and rotate often, just given the nature of hunting. So hopefully that answered your question. If you didn't, feel free to pop back in with um, a follow-up question, and I'll do my best to answer it. Ozma? All right. Next one is, uh, what does a career progression look like for an MBA in the financial solutions team at M Mercer Government? Uh, great question. So. Um, <laughs> I always struggle answering this question because it's 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 actually an awesome thing in that there's no one structure. I think so often we're we're used to, you know, the the, the old adage of you know corporate ladder or you know kind of one path that um, you can progress. Um, I say think of it like a choose your own adventure game. And so when you start, you all start kind of doing the same kind of work to get a flavor. You need to understand what Medicaid is, and you really need to. It's a it's a lot to learn. Um, so you start there, but as you progress based on a your personal interests, I kind of alluded to this a little bit last time, um, but it, it, as your personal interests evolve and as you identify and work on certain kind of projects, you'll realize very quickly um, kind of where you'd like to go. So here's a couple of options. So you might have a very interest being an MBA, you might have a very big interest in kind of managing projects and being maybe a PMI uh, you know, PMP or PMI um, with the PMI Institute. Maybe you want to be a certified project manager and you really like the organization of teams. So that's one career path. And if that's an interest to you up front, we'll kind of help guide you in that. Um, if that develops over time, we'll do that as well. Um, another interest really might be maybe as an MBA, you really have an interest in that relational aspect that I talked about. So your goal ultimately is to really manage the client relationship and to really be talking with them about their big picture ideas and helping strategize that big picture and then kind of working with your team, you know, which might be 50 people on your, your particular client. If you're managing, let's say you're, say you're going to manage this, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So if you're managing that, that's a really big client and they do a lot of different things. So you would be the relationship manager. We call that the client leader and managing that all the business within that state. And so then you'd be kind of flooding work down and delegating work down for everything that's going on in your state, whether it's in the financial sector or whether it's clinical work, whether it's policy, that would kind of be your ultimate progression. So you kind of work up your way and start, you know, you, you'd be a you know, project lead on one project as your first step. And then maybe you'd lead, um, you know, kind of like all financial work in that particular state. And then as you're doing that, you would be really working with those other sectors to really understand that relationship aspect for those sectors so that you could then work your way up to being a client leader. Um, so those are kind of two main things. Um, another option is you don't have to specialize. We have a lot of people that don't become specialists that like really being a generalist. So that means that they can be plug and play. Um, they're that universal accord that we all are looking for that they can just plug in and no matter what the problem is, if they're the first person that I think of when I've got a problem in my state because no matter what it is, they can help me. 
Um, and so you can either be a specialist or a generalist. And the good news is you don't have to have it all figured out day one. Um, we will work with you. Everybody gets a people manager and that people manager's goal is really to help develop your career. Um, and you're encouraged to assign a mentor to select a mentor. And uh, we have a very robust mentor program. Um, we are huge into building one another up. Um, you will never ever see a principal or a partner that's trying to keep somebody down to make themselves look better. Um, it will always be in their best interest to bring somebody up with them. So um, there is un just unimaginable opportunity to really grow your career in really whatever path that you choose. Um, we can help you get there. Um, Ozma? Stacey, um, first thing, do we want to kind of maybe just take off the slides so we can oh, um, get on sure. video and, and see if Yes, I would love else... to see faces. <laughs> yeah, and oh, if um, you guys, go. if anyone um, wants to be brave enough to get off um, or put yourselves on video and ask a question, feel free. Um, I'm truly not scary, so uh, <laughs> bring it on. Um, Stacey, you have touched upon this, um, you know, so far in the presentation and just kind of, you know, sharing with us some of the roles, but can you kind of maybe dig in a little bit more about how um, different is like, the, is the work every day different or is it mostly standardized? Um, and then furthermore, what types of qualities are we looking for in Mercer GHSE consultants? Um, great question again. Um, so uh, let me start at the top as it relates to your question on different or the same. Um, certainly, you know, I referenced that rate setting is our bread and butter, right? So certainly there are projects that are similar um, to projects that you'll do before. Um, one of the key interesting things about being just in the healthcare space in general and particularly in public healthcare is that even when it's the same, it's not. So maybe it's all ice cream and, you know, you're, you're eating ice cream but you thought you were gonna get chocolate and now you're eating Rocky Road. I hope, I hope you're, you like Rocky Road. Um, if you don't, I'm really sorry. Pick, pick your flavor, um, insert here. Um, so, you know, it can be similar um, if you're working on, let's say a rate setting project, you worked on one last month or last quarter and you're working on rate setting again for the same client. There are going to be a lot of similar elements, but there is going to be a lot that is new and new problems every day. Um, so everything is always going to be changing and evolving. So you won't be in a, you know, I use the term turn the crank. You know, you're not just going to be over there just turning that crank. Uh, sorry, with my virtual background, I look a little funny. So you can, you guys can uh, laugh, giggle a little bit about that. So, um, so there will be some things that are similar, but generally speaking, um, just about every day is different. Um, consulting is, is, you know, I'm a big stenopad. I literally have it sitting here on my desk right now um, with the things that I want to do today. Um, so I do that the night before. It's just part of my thing that I've been doing now for my 25 year career. Um, but um, generally speaking, that immediately has changed the morning of, but at least then I've got my list of the stuff I wanted to do today. Um, so a little bit the same, but a lot of different kinds of things. There's also a lot of opportunity because we get new things. You'll hear a lot from the principals or the partners where they'll be like, hey, Massachusetts really wants to evaluate um, what new hep C drugs are coming out. And is anybody interested in that and want to kind of do some extra digging? So there's a lot of opportunity to kind of raise your hand and you know, do something that's innovative. Maybe hep C isn't that exciting, I don't know. But, but just as an example, something that would come up and that gives you an opportunity to um, volunteer for something on the side that will allow you some exposure maybe to a different team or different partners um, or a different, completely different type of work so that you can decide what you like and what you don't like. Um, so as far as, so that's that, as it relates to the qualities that we're looking for, um, we're a team of critical thinker problem solvers. So certainly folks that really enjoy problem solving and really thinking through things. Um, if you, um, generally speaking, we look for a lot of technical folks. So people that are really enjoy financial analysis, uh, really digging into Excel models, um, uh, you know, math majors, finance majors, computer science, business analytics, um, folks that have some SQL experience or enjoy that analytic aspect is perfect for informatics. Um, if you have an interest in healthcare, 
Um, you know, you don't have to have any healthcare experience. Again, I did not when I started with Mercer. Most of our folks that we hire, particularly at the college level, don't. But you know, having an interest in healthcare. I mean, this is going to be um, you know your life, your college life, your I mean, your career life. Um, and so, having that interest in healthcare and interested in how it all works, um, inquisitive people, people that are um, really need to enjoy working as a team. Certainly, there's a ton of independent work. Um, you know, if you're working on an Excel model, that's difficult to do with two people. Um, you know, so certainly there's a lot of individual work, but we do that collaboratively. And what's cool for you know for people in your shoes is that it's not the principals and the partners that are in the meetings with the clients and it's not them trying to strategize and figure out what to do it's the entire team so from intern on up you're all in a meeting together whiteboarding and trying to evaluate and trying to come up with cool solutions that we can best present to our clients so um we're a pretty flat organization the the principal and the partner yes at the end of the day those folks the buck stops with them you know they're ultimately accountable but the rest of the team is just as important um, and is still as visible often to the client. So did that answer all the pieces of that multi-tiered question, Ozma, or did I miss anything? I think you got it all. And I think you answered a few other questions along the way. I try to find uh, a few bonus, <laughs> bonus answers for you. Um, here's a good one. What are some trends in Medicaid that are important and may pose as an interesting challenge for or opportunity going forward? a great question you know try to stump the stump stump the consultants so that's awesome <laughs> so um, I'm gonna throw out my favorite of the day um, so you know I've gotten this question a lot this year as I've talked with students in particular um, you know uh, COVID of this world the reason why I'm looking at your faces across zoom a little zoom pictures here um, you know, COVID has thrown a wrench into all of our lives, right? Um, I'm guessing most of you are attending classes online or at least hybrid. Um, so I'm working full time from, from home um, as, as we're dealing with this pandemic. So COVID has presented a very interesting challenge to Medicaid. So um, I talked about that crystal ball, right? So we work with our states on, you know, trying to predict what's going to happen in the future so they can balance their budget and balance those healthcare needs for their population. Um, generally, we can come really, really close. Um, we're really good at what we do. But who could have predicted COVID? Uh, nobody. Um, you know, this time last year, uh, you know, we weren't talking about COVID. We weren't, that we had no claims to, you know, to look at that would say there's going to be this pandemic. Um, so there is a really big need within our populations, and this of course isn't identified, this isn't specific to Medicaid, but it is affecting heavily our state clients. And I would say, and at probably the majority of our clients, we have ongoing engagements right now where we really try to help them identify, you know, pandemic response. So using COVID as an example, how do we really identify pandemic response and make sure that we are allocating resources appropriately and that we are planning for something in the future as well. Um, so it's really changing the way our clients really structure and, and do business day to day. Um, another big one, I'll pick ones that we all know and can, can relate to, um, Affordable Health Care Act, when that was identified, that was a huge change for us. It's where we really saw the beginning of our massive growth within the government practice. Um, that completely changed um, the regulations and how Medicaid is even structured. So it changed, you know, completely turned it just on its, you know, side, it completely did it. We had to do a 180 with how states were doing business from one day to the next. Um, and so anytime there is any kind of change, um, you know, turn on your news um, or, you know, I guess, does anybody actually watch the news on TV? I don't know, but you know, look at your app and, and read your news. Um, any kind of turmoil or change in, in the government, whether it's a presidential change, whether it's a cabinet change, any of those kinds of things, whether it's a governor change, um, change happens all the time. Um, and as consultants, we're not scared of change. Actually, change is great for us. So change is just the name of the game, and it just means that we have to pivot a little bit, and we adjust. Um, our goal isn't about my personal, what I think we should do. It's really about getting the client where they want to go. Um, so did that help a little bit, you think? Okay. 
Yeah, please feel free to nod or, you know, do some sort of body language. Thank you. I see. I, I, I was going to call out some folks, but I don't want to do that. But thank you uh, for those of you that are giving me some feedback. That's great. Um, since we're on the Medicaid, there was a little follow-up question about how, um, if Mercer has an interest in this as well and in, in making more, in making public health care more accessible. Um, and either advocating for Medicaid expansion or expanding eligibility and coverage for CHIP and Medicare? Um, and if so, what does Mercer's advocacy efforts look like in this space? Uh, a really insightful question. Somebody's done some research. Um, whoever, uh, kudos to whoever is referencing CHIP. So uh, CHIP programs, for those of you that don't know, um, those are the programs uh, focused on children. Um, in the Medicaid space, so um, uh, so yeah, I mean, gold star, um, a, a on that one. Um, so complicated question answer and a complicated question. Um, so I would love, be happy to talk offline with whoever is interested in that to follow it further. But the high high level answer, I would say, you know, um, Mercer is, we of course are advocating for uh, Medicaid expansion when it's in the best interest of the state. Um, so, you know, uh, so I'm in Phoenix. So if you can think back, um, you probably may or may not be aware that of course when Medicaid expansion was happening with affordable health care. So I'm in a um, very conservative state in Arizona. And we did choose and vote to expand Medicaid with the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, but the governor um, did receive a lot of flack for that um, at being, um, you know, in a conservative state. So for us, it's really about advising the pros and the cons. It's not really our job to, you know, tell a state what they should or shouldn't do. But it is certainly our um, job to inform them of the pros and the cons and what the ramifications are if they move one way or the other. So often the client might come, let's just say they want to come and they're like, hey, I want to go down this path. Well, fine, sure, we'll take you down that path. But we're going to then say, if a client comes to me and says that, I'm going to say, hey, well, I did, an, I did an evaluation. And are you aware that the bridge is out on that road? So you want to go down that road, but the bridge is completely out. So are you sure you really want to go down that road? And if it's so, we'll find you a detour. And that often is really what my job ends up being about. It's about looking at all of those options and trying to kind of say, okay, client, you really want to do this. I, I'm not sure that's a great idea, but okay. And um, what are the what are the impacts to that decision? And A, I can offer alternatives, but if they still want to go down this path, I, I'm there, you know, I work for them. And so I'll help you there, but they need to understand that here's all the limitations that that path has and how we're going to try to navigate and get around them. So, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not really our job to tell the clients what to do. It's our job to advise them of their options and, you know, make sure that they understand regulatory impacts, um, financial impacts, all of those things. But then ultimately they decide and we, you know, help, help mitigate those decisions. Um, one cool thing as a follow-up to that question um, that does relate, um, there is a committee called MACPAC, that is part of the federal, that advises the federal government on Medicaid issues. Um, there are, gosh, I should know this. Um, I wanna say five or six members of MACPAC um, that are on this committee and advising as part of the core board. Um, Mercer government, our actuarial and financial sector leader, Stacy Lampkin, um, one of my bosses, um, is on that board. And so, um, you know, to your, to your point of, you know, what's Mercer's advocacy look like, um, we certainly were involved in advising the federal government with the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, and we're also continuing to be on MACPAC as well as other things similarly. Uh, MACPAC is just the most widely known and just the most recognized. Um, and it's a huge, huge thing to have somebody on that, this board um, and it really speaks highly to Mercer's position in this market. Um, we are the only consulting firm um, that is on that board. And, um, and so, you know, I think that speaks pretty highly and recognizes you know, our impact into this, this um, ability to you know, advise our states and the federal government where appropriate. 
Um, okay, do we have any more questions? I know we're at maybe 15 minutes till the end. We have a few. Um, one was particularly about just kind of our travel mod model and what we, you know, how does travel look um, like at Mercer? Um, and, you know, if COVID affected that, I did address a little bit of that and mention that, you know, our um, our model here at Mercer is not like a traditional consulting model. Um, we, we mostly work from our home office. Um, and so luckily we weren't impacted by, by travel and COVID. So anything else you want to add to that? Um, and then I'll follow up with another question for you. Okay. And, you know, in government, it's a little different than a traditional Mercer. Um, not all of our clients can be local, of course. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm in Arizona, so there's only one client option I could have. Um, and I personally actually never worked on the state of Arizona. Um, but um, because we're working for government entities, we're not, you know, they, they, they aren't looking for us to fly out and take them golfing, um, you know, every week, right? Like, you know, what you, at least what I think of traditionally with a consultant. Um, so we mostly do most of our meetings over a teleconference or more commonly Zoom. Um, but a lot of clients do enjoy, certainly there are things that are easier to do on site where we can really truly interact um, day to day. So some clients we travel to more than others, um, but by no stretch are you on the road, you know, 50% of the time, you know, like, like maybe what you're thinking, uh, what you may be thinking with a management consulting firm. Um, and so we did, of course, we aren't doing any travel right now. Um, so even if schools were allowing me to on campus, I would not be um, going on campus uh, right now. But hopefully that will, will end here shortly. And then folks will start traveling again at some point, um, but still probably pretty minimal. All right. Um, what are the firm's expectations for billable hours versus personal development hours um, for getting on projects? Is it networking, interest, skill-based? Um, and what's the bench policy when selecting projects? Uh, great, great question. Um, so yes, we do have billable hours. Um, unlike maybe traditional um, you know, consulting firms, um, the billable hours are very, the goals are very reasonable. Um, it's, it's uh, I, I have literally never had an analyst worry that they're gonna meet hours. And again, I've been around a long time and interacting with a lot of analysts. And um, we really heavily focus on work-life balance. Um, so um, I, I have kids. Um, I've never worried that I couldn't, you know, attend a fundraiser for my school, my kids' school. Um, I've been on PTO, PTA, um, you know, all of those different things, um, community service, et cetera. So there's certainly work-life balance. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. So um, that's one of the benefits of consulting is that there's flexibility. So if you want to kind of adjust and flex your hours, um, there's often an easy uh, workable solution with that. As it relates to kind of the personal time, it depends on what that personal time is. So for example, Mercer gives paid time off for community service. So there is that program already instituted. So you're really just, I will give you this advice, whether it's Mercer or any other company that you go to, it all comes down to communication. So communicate, communicate, communicate talk with your people manager, talk with your teams, make sure folks are aware of whatever your interest is, um, make sure that people are aware of, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. So if I, you know, if my staff, if I know where they're trying to go, I will move heaven and earth to try to get them there and give them the right tools and, you know, the tips that I think connect them with the right people that are going to allow them to get to where they want to go. Um, if I don't know, even if I ask, I'm always proactive about asking, but sometimes people don't tell me. And if I don't know, I can't help. So um, again, no matter where you work, I would say just, just follow that mantra, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, people can't help you if they don't know. Um, but there are tips and tricks. You can volunteer, you'll work with your people manager. You can say, hey, I'm really interested in this risk adjustment project. It sounds super fun. I think I can do it on top of the work that I'm already here. As a people manager, I might look at you and say, hey, I really think you're overloaded, but if this is really something you wanna do, let's see if we can find somebody that we can move this project to over here so that you can really work on this risk adjustment project. It doesn't always work that cleanly, but that would be something that we would likely try to address, but I would work with you to kind of see if you were okay with that. Because again, the, the goal isn't to take work away, but if the goal is to really get you onto this risk adjustment project because you think it sounds really cool and this really doesn't sound as exciting, 
let's see if we can find somebody else that's interested in the type of work that you're not interested in and see if we can do a swap. So um, there's always options. Um, so again, it's really that working together and collaborating to try to come out with the best possible outcome. Hosma? Yes, here's one that would be, um, very, that will be very useful for everyone on the call. Uh, what's the recruiting process like? Uh, do we have case interviews or mostly behavioral interviews? Um, it, it, we will do generally behavioral interviews, um, but we also do ask some technical questions. So, for example, if you are applying for an informatics business analyst, which is not my area of expertise for the record, so don't ask me those kind of questions. Um, I can ask, I can talk about it high level. Um, but I do not know how to use SAS. Um, but our team will probably ask you, so thinking about school, what kind of projects did you do where you had to analyze some data? And maybe a question might be something like, um, what, what was a, a time where you had bad data? And you know, have you had an experience with bad data? Um, what'd you do? How'd you make allowances? What, what kind of caveats did you, if you had to insert you know, some assumptions, how did you make sure that the recipient of your analysis understood the assumptions you made in making that, um, you know, kind of making that data up, uh, for example. So, you know, those are the kinds of things we want to understand more often. It's really your thought process and thinking through the steps. Um, that's kind of what we are looking for. Um, you know, sadly, in our world, often there's not one plus one is two. You know, there's some sort of weird variable where, you know, one plus one doesn't equal two for some reason today. So um, we want you to, you know, to, to, we want to understand your thought process. So no case study or case kind of interview as it relates to the interviews. Um, it's more a behavioral type that we will specifically ask some technical questions. If you say that you've had an advanced Excel class, but then can't, you know, get a, you know, an answer on how to work something in Excel, um, something's not kind of jiving, I guess, is how that would work. Awesome. Okay, I think we have time for one more, and I will see which one the lucky question is. Um, this is this will be a good one. Stacy mentioned that in the org the, that the organization is flatter than typical. Uh, does that mean that interns will do a fair amount of mixed work, due diligence, and client facing? Uh, what does that uh, breakdown look like percentage-wise? Yes, absolutely. Our interns, um, no coffee getting here. Um, so our interns are hired and they do the exact same job that our analysts do. Um, now, it's abridged, obviously. We've got, you know, 10 weeks over the summer. So uh, it's, it's, you know, confined to the type of work that you would do in that 10 weeks. Um, Client-facing, um, Generally, our interns don't go on site to our clients. Um, it just doesn't work in that 10 week mark. But it is um, almost always our interns are involved in those on our over the Zoom uh, client meetings and collaborating in those same meetings that our other staff are as well. So you, it is our intent, um, and I think we do a really good job of this. I feel really proud of our intern program. Um, it is our intent while you're there, you get a full understanding of what it would be like to work at Mercer Government uh, you know, full time. And of course, it's always our intent with our interns um, that you're doing a great job and we're doing a good job giving you that experience. And we really want you to leave your internship knowing that you're going to come back, you know, the next year full time. That's always our intent and our hope. Um, it doesn't always work, but we have a really high conversion rate with our interns. And so I feel really proud of that. Those one? Um, I did see one question pop up. I just want to, um, that I briefly saw. Um, so you talked about a master's degree. Um, a lot of people are pursuing their master's. We absolutely um, take master's students, but we also, you do not need a master's to come work at Mercer Government. So somebody had that question about, you know, what, what does my outlook look like as a bachelor's degree? Um, it's pretty much the same. Um, obviously, master's degree, bachelor's degree, different, but the, the roles are the same and um, the opportunities are 100% there if all you have, and I say all you have, um, just because of that master's um, bent spin to the prior conversations. Um, bachelor's is just fine. For the record, I only have a bachelor's degree, so, uh, you know, don't, don't feel bad. Um, okay, this one last question I think we can get answered. Uh, considering that Mercer government has grown by a huge extent in the past 30 years, what are GHSC's future plans for growth in the next five to 10 years? 
Gosh, that is a really big question. Um, and so uh, I think generally we're just hanging on for the ride. And so our biggest, um, our biggest focus on growth is a few key areas. Um, Long-term care is a very large focus for us right now. Um, CHIP is also whoever, I wish I knew who, who mentioned CHIP, um, but that CHIP continues to be a big growth project within um, the Medicaid space, and it is an area we are particularly focused on. Um, but more importantly, where we're really focused on, we have um, an opportunity to expand into a few key states that we have not ever been able to um, be in before. And these are really, really big projects. Um, they will include us collaborating with some external organizations as well. So that's really our main focus, and it is going to, uh, those states are going to um, increase our staffing capacity significantly because we will need a lot of resources to work on um, each of those states that we have the opportunity, um, and we are the, the favorite in the running uh, currently. So um, I'm really excited about that. And um, you know, kind of taking these states to new incredible levels. Anyone else? I think we're probably at our time. But if there's a short, quick thing, I'd happy to answer. I would say I'm happy to connect with anybody on LinkedIn. Um, reach out. Um, I'd love to dialogue with you for, on whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, so feel free to reach out. And of course, Uzma is Uzma and I work together almost on the daily. So, uh, you know, uh, feel free if you're talking with Uzma as well. That's great. And uh, we're happy to answer any and all questions, whether it's just career-wise or Mercer-wise or both. Thank you so much, Stacey. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we look forward to connecting with you guys in the future. Everyone have a great afternoon or morning. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. It was really fun. Bye. Thanks a lot.